Become a Therapist podcast plus listeners can listen to episodes early and ad-free right now. Become a plus listener by going to Apple Podcasts, searching for the Trauma Therapist podcast, and signing up today. Welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to help trauma therapists be their incredible selves, to be human, to be real, not just a clinician. I'm a big believer in who we are is more important than what we know. And this requires cultivating authenticity, genuineness, and vulnerability, and that requires intention. You can learn more about my courses and workshops by going to thetraumatherapistproject.com. That's thetraumatherapistproject.com. Let's get started. All right, Monica, here we go. So five, four, three, two, and one. Our right, folks, welcome back to the podcast. I am very excited. It happens to my kiss today, Monica Guzman. Monica, welcome. Thank you for having me. Hello. You're welcome. So Monica is Senior Fellow for Public Practice at Braver Angels, a nonprofit working to depolarize America. She's also host of A Braver Way, a podcast that equips people with the tools they need to bridge the political divide in their everyday lives. She's also founder and CEO of Reclaim Curiosity, an organization working to build a more curious world. Monica is also the author of I Never Thought of It That Way, to have fearlessly curious conversations in dangerously divided times. Monica is the inaugural McGurn Fellow at the University of Florida, working with researchers at the UF College of Journalism and Communications and beyond to better understand ways to employ techniques described in her book to boost understanding. Monica, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. You're welcome. <laughs> so before we get going, share with the listeners where you're from originally and where you are currently. I was born in Monterrey, Mexico, and I immigrated to the States when I was about six, five or six. I keep forgetting. And I'm currently in Seattle, Washington. Okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So I came across your work and, you know, immediate, what immediately jumped out to me amongst the many things you're doing is passion. I mean, you're obviously passionate and you're on a friggin' mission. I don't know what it is. We're going to find out. But how how did all of this start for you? Yeah, I love that you brought that up, passion. I do tend to be a bit fiery. My husband is very calm, cool, water type element. And I'm I'm always, is this going on? So I'm I'm that kind of person. So I guess if it shows, it shows. The way I got into this work, which I would describe as bridging work, bridging the political divide, bridging any difference that matters to people, one is through my journalism. So I've been a journalist my whole career. And what I realized was that the thing that really draws me to journalism is this belief I have that people need to be able to understand each other and that by trying to tell, learn, and then tell people's stories to their communities as responsibly as I can, I can maybe help contribute to that end goal. What happened in journalism sometime over the last decade, a bit of a slow boil, was my coming to realize that there's so much distrust and kind of a foundational brokenness across elements of our society, so many silos, where reality starts to look really different. And it's hard to communicate or share stories across all those spaces. And so I realized, if I want to help people understand each other, and I just do it through journalism, it's not going to be enough, because there's too much brokenness. So I stepped back from daily journalism to work on this. The other big thread that brings me to this work, and I suppose the passion is my family. So I'm a Mexican immigrant. I'm the daughter of Mexican immigrants. They are Republicans who voted twice for Donald Trump. And I'm a Democrat who voted for Clinton and then Biden. And you can imagine the tensions that came up in our family. I'm sure a lot of listeners have related to those in their lives. It got very real. And we are a pretty open family. I'm very close to my parents. I still am. But there were some dark times. There were some very loud conversations, louder than normal. 
And somehow that heat actually led us to some real understanding. And if I'm honest, it was mostly me who craved that understanding because of how I felt about the candidate I did not vote for. And yet I was able to to really learn a lot about my parents and the process of asking a lot of questions about what led them to their beliefs. And then I looked around the country and saw that brokenness just get worse within families, within communities, a lot of vilification, a lot of incuriosity that's understandable given how high stakes everything is Mm -hmm. and how hard it is to feel like you have resources at hand. So that led me to the, what became a pretty obsessive quest to figure out what was getting in the way of us understanding each other, what was blinding us in these divided times and how we can get it out of our way so that we can see each other again. When I say that I work to try to build a curious world, what I mean by that is a world that sees itself. Now, before we kind of uh, work to unfold that, you know, you talk about this kind of insatiable uh, curiosity for understanding and to help people understand. Where does that come from? For me? Yeah. There's some surprising twists. I was a very shy kid. I didn't want to talk to strangers. And as I trace my story back and back, I realized that there were these two competing tendencies within me. One was this shyness. Uh, I didn't, I just, I did. I got very, very nervous around strangers. I remember this one time that my mother, we had a Burger King near our house and she made me, I wanted salt and she made me go up to the counter and ask a human being for a packet of salt. And I was traumatized. I didn't want to do it. It was just like, no, that. mom, why can't you do it? <laughs> so there was that shyness. Like, I just don't I mean, she was like, go talk to someone. Oh, yeah. She's like, yeah, you are yeah. going to go and get your salt. It's all yeah. you want salt. And it's fine. Mom, uh, uh, you are going to get your salt. Uh, the other tendency, honestly, is uh, this fascination with people. And I don't really know how far back this goes necessarily, but it got stronger and stronger that this sense of people are so interesting. Uh, There was actually a moment in second grade, I want to say, where I was like finished with a test or whatever it was. And I handed it in as a little spelling thing, handed it in. And I grabbed another piece of paper, brought it to my desk. And I just started writing what people were doing. You know, like Jennifer Puck went up to get a tissue. You know, Craig Maggio just like, I don't know, changed the way he was sitting. This somewhat boring recitation of the events of people around me. The teacher, you know, uh, just got up to close the door. So I just observe people. They're so interesting and they're always surprising. So at some point, and I'm pretty sure this happened in my journalism internships uh, in college, my shyness went up against my fascination with people and lost. Mm. So they're just too interesting. I want to ask a lot of questions. And what's happened in my journalism, and it's probably one of my favorite states of being, is when I just get lost in an interview. I just get lost. I am transparent and I'm in someone else's story and I'm helping them look around and realize how interesting they are. A lot of times they didn't even know. Hmm. And I think it's one of the coolest gifts to give someone to let them know that, in fact, they are interesting. Mm hmm. This is very obviously a timely conversation given the world, you know, the state of the world, political state of the world in which we're living. How do you go about, how do you begin to help two uh, parties disparate in their beliefs and ideology? How do you begin to help them understand? Where do you start with that? There's a lot of potential places to start. But I think the most important place to aim your curiosity when you don't understand someone else is within yourself. And what I mean by that is one of the biggest barriers to our curiosity that is also really sneaky is our own assumptions. So we as human beings make assumptions all day, every day, all the time. A lot of them we just need, right? Like if we if we assumed that every little noise we heard was a reason to go, what's that? What's that? We couldn't get anything done. (laughs) Some assumptions make sense. Others really don't. And our brains just take shortcuts. That's what they do. The arch villain of curiosity is certainty. 
because mm-hmm. when you think you know, you won't think to ask. So assumptions are answers to questions you never th- actually asked. Your brain just answered them for you. So what we have to do is notice the assumptions we're making about other people. Now, when you encounter or approach someone who is very different from you and you know that, a lot of assumptions are going to come to mind. There's a lot of social science research in the last few years. It's pretty chilling about the misperceptions that exist between political parties, people who have different political beliefs. This exists across almost any division and difference and disagreement, but it's particularly pronounced with our political divides because of all the things that we all feel, the tribalism going on, the high stakes, you know, the, the sense of threat. So aim your curiosity inside yourself. Notice your own assumptions. You're you're conservative and you're approaching a young, I'm, I'm going to just traffic in stereotypes for a minute. You're approaching a younger person with some tattoos and some piercings, right? And they tell you they have they, them pronouns. And if, if you're conservative, and I'm, I'm again, I'm generalizing, that might... <laughs> That might be very uncomfortable. What do you assume about that person? And the way that you defeat assumptions control over your brain is to turn them into questions, right? So if you assume that this person is someone who, if I talk to them, they would cancel me the first moment, they, they the first chance they get, right? Is that true? Maybe ask some questions, get to know them, you know? Um, if you assume anything about them, this person, I'm religious and they're probably not, they probably hate religion, you don't know this person. How do you know that? And I could give the exact same example with, you know, someone who's more liberal approaching someone who's conservative, who's sending signals in any way to them that download assumptions into their mind. So that's that's one very, very important thing is to remember each person is a bottomless mystery. Uh, so to, to be real careful with uh, throwing assumptions around like that. One of the, th- you know, as you're speaking, I'm thinking to myself, that this conversation almost seems like a a minefield of assumptions. It's hard to talk about this almost without making assumptions. It seems to me, however, that this this invitation to uh, curiosity and awareness is something that not all of us are willing to take on. Mm-hmm. You know, in order to have this conversation, we have to be willing to look at ourselves. And as you're saying, s- start looking inward. But not everyone's willing to do that. Mm-hmm. What do you say to that? I mean, because how are you going to bring two parties together if one, maybe they are disagreeing, mm-hmm. but they're not willing to even l- begin to look at their se- uh, themselves? Mm-hmm. Well, I look at a state of unwillingness as being a state Uh, we can all be in that state (laughs) of unwilling to be curious. I do it every day. You know, I try to peel myself open. So it's not a permanent way of being. That's one thing. And one of the things that I think causes an unwillingness and a rigidity um, for being open to how people might surprise us and whatnot is when we have a lot of unacknowledged concerns and we have been practiced in this idea, or we have steeped ourselves in spaces that have these narratives that tell us it's, it's those people's fault. It's those people's fault. Those people won't listen to you. They never mm-hmm. will. They never mm-hmm. will. So why should you listen to them? <laughs> or, or when we're in narratives about harm, you know, those people just want to hurt you. That's all they want. They want you to lose. So why would you talk with them? You're just going to give them ammo. Right. So the more that we are steeped in spaces that give us those narratives and the more conditioned we are by being in those spaces where this is apparently permissible to just make blanket assumptions about lots of people all the time, then the more that we will also be met with a sense of threat, you know, that our bodies and our minds, when we approach people who are different from us, are just going to immediately be on guard. We don't want to be open. We don't uh uh-uh, no. You know, the only way we engage right now is if we can convince them they're wrong and lessen the threat. I'm not okay until that person changes. So I think a lot of people are in this place and it's because of certainty and because certainty can be very soothing. When you have a really tough question, why did they vote that way? Mm -hmm. And it's a really anxiety inducing question. You will manufacture certainty. If you read a thought piece on the internet that gives you a sense, and it's very confident, you could just choose to believe all of that. You know, I've just read, I've just read a story 
that tells me why they voted that way. So I don't need to go ask them. Why would I need to do that? I already know. So, so yes, it's a mix of certainty and fear and the experience that we all hate of feeling unheard. So the book's titled, I never thought, never thought of it that way, how to have fearlessly curious conversations in dangerously divided times. What was the impetus for the book? Seeing where we were as a society, feeling that alienation from journalism, which is where I had identified my professional fulfillment for a long time and feeling like it wasn't enough. Um, a real big thing came after the 2016 election when I live here in Seattle, very Democrat liberal place, surrounded by fellow liberals. And I would hear the fear, especially right after that election, the discomfort and the anxiety and the insecurity, and I would share it. And I would see conversations almost inevitably turn toward who to blame. And it would be those horrible people who voted for Trump. You know, anyone who votes for a monster must be a monster themselves kind of thing. And what started to happen in me is that I started taking it personally when I heard my fellow liberals say that. And it was because they're talking about my parents and mm -hmm. my parents are great. And they're saying these things about them that really aren't true. Right. And, and yes, there are lots of differences and yes, there are high stakes, but mm -mm. and it, it just started to feel like I have to say something back, but I don't know where to start. Because it's not like they're, quote unquote, wrong about, yes, there are deep disagreements. Yes, there's hard issues we need to talk about. Where do you begin? Mm -hmm. um, and so I started to get quiet. Uh, at some point, I started to get quiet and I started to go into my own notes and I pulled up like I started this whole like Slack channel for myself and just started populating it with all these notes. And that led that was like two years later, I had a book. And, and I guess that was what I would say back. And, and it wasn't. Um, I really believe in stories and I really believe in tactical, practical things. And I was also writing that book for myself. What, what can I do to still be curious in an increasingly blinded world? What can I do? Because I don't want to be a person who can't see the world as it is. I don't want to be a person who lives in silos because they think that's the only safe place. So what can I do? And then what can I do to make those tools more accessible to other people? So is is in the goal in part to not necessarily uh, uh, disagree with the fact that there are factions and different ideologies, but to have a discussion and, as you said, see where where everyone is at. Is is that what you're after in a sense? Absolutely. It's it's not about okay, we got to change everyone's minds. Obviously, right, that often right. gets in the way. It's it's about seeing the world in its full complexity and going through the journey it takes to actually be able to do that. You talked about the unwillingness, right? There's a lot of barriers in our way, but yes, that's it. I don't believe in a functional democracy where everyone agrees. I think that is impossible. And I think that would be horrible for us. I believe in diversity. We should have diversity of views and opinions, but what good is a diversity of views and opinions if they're not in conversation with each other? What good is a diversity of views and opinions if each camp begins to believe that they are the only ones with any right answer ever and they already have all the right answers? That's just dumb. That's just never true. Mm -hmm. So the the fact that we are losing that communication, those spaces between factions um, where there can be that communication, that's a huge problem for us. So there is that altruistic sense. But let me also speak to a lot of people don't really care about that. They're like, whatever, someone else can save the world. You know, <laughs> that's not on me. Well, I look around and I see elevated levels of anxiety. I see pain at brokenness in relationships. I see relatives who can't talk to each other anymore. And I see, trust me, I get a lot of emails and notes from people who have holes in, in their heart, right, mm -hmm. over this. And how... When you look at it, it's like, really? <laughs> like, our politics can do this to us, cause this anxiety and this pain? And so it becomes really important to question our fear and question our certainty because of the consequences it's having just for our sanity every day. If we could live a little bit less scared of our neighbors, we would be more creative, more expansive, and more at peace. 
and we could solve the problems that are actually staring us in the face mm. instead of the problems that we assume are staring us in the face from the exaggerations on social media. What do you say to someone listening who, you know, we just had the holidays. I'm sure there were a lot of difficult, challenging conversations over the, over the, dinner tables. But what do you say to someone who does have a relative who is on the complete opposite end of, of the spectrum and who is adamant about about their beliefs and doesn't doesn't even want to enter into a conversation? I mean, it's it's more than just to me, like honoring someone else's belief. I mean, a lot of these beliefs on both sides of the spectrum stand for something, right? Mm-hmm. They, they, they represent something. How could you believe in that? How could you vote for someone who did that or said that? Mm-hmm. Well, it's exactly what you just said, but it's a different tone. Instead of how could you believe that? How could you possibly believe that? If you change that question in your mind to how could you believe that? How could you possibly believe that? It becomes a curious question instead of a demand or an assertion that that person is invalid. So um, the thing that is hard to accept, but is an inconvenient truth, and I think will never change, is that people can only hear when they're heard. If you have someone in your family who is adamant, who is inflexible, (laughs) who never going to hear you, the one path to that person is to hear them. And you might say, well, I've tried. Well, maybe you have. Maybe you have for a long time. And I cannot guarantee that it will ever open up. But if you are really curious and if you do want to establish some connection and if you do someday want that person to hear you and the, the things that you believe that bother you so much about what they believe in the first place, the only way in is to begin by hearing them. And I will say from a lot of experience, the nut can crack a lot faster than you think. It is very difficult. I shouldn't say difficult. It is just very rare. It's not difficult. It is very rare to hear someone fully. And that experience is like sticking a key in a lock. Even can you hear someone you disagree with for five minutes where you do not jump in with your opinion and where you in fact Ask questions to understand them better. So is this what you mean? Or is it that? Tell me more about that. What led you to believe that, Uncle Bob? And in each of those questions, you are not ready to pounce. You are giving the tone of curiosity. Can you do that for five minutes? That's my challenge. Just start there. And then move on. Okay, pass the turkey. Whatever, we're done. (laughs) We do not have to get satisfaction or resolution of any kind. Uh, The best conversation is the one you can pick up again later. And so Uncle Bob, after five minutes of being heard by you, curious, the heck was that? With no judgment at all? Is going to be like, well, that was kind of interesting. He was interested in me. And I got to tell you, as a journalist, people, everybody wants to be seen and heard. And when you are really seen and heard, it's... It's a really powerful experience and we want more of it as long as we can trust that person, you know? And again, the goal is not to find some resolution or, or even commonality, but to hear mm-hmm. and appreciate and hopefully understand and be curious about mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the person, the other person's ex- yeah. experience. That's the first goal. I think it would be disingenuous to say that, gosh, it would be really great if this other person agreed with me. I think it's fine to admit that to yourself. But understanding that there are ways that you can sabotage that for yourself. And one of the first ways would be come in with judgment, not actually hear this person out or believe, as so many of us do, that they have nothing to teach us. Mm-hmm. And, and, and especially when people hold more extreme beliefs, we really believe that. Not only they have nothing to teach us, but they are horrible people. They are evil people. If we're opening the Pandora's box then oh no we're implicated now their horrible words have spread in the world and it will infect others it's like all of these things that we do to ourselves because we think it'll ensure that we are good people are actually creating i think more harm because they're making a more distrustful world where communication is impossible we dismiss the harm in that you know when we tell ourselves 
it will be harmful for me to talk to this other person at all. There are ways to make it quite harmless. Hmm. Um, at least, at least if you yourself are ready. And I have to say, there is no universal prescription for this. You know, there are some topics with some people in some situations I'm not about to wade into. And that's probably true for everybody. The thing is, everyone has their own unique formula. And I tend to reject, there's some people who say, you know, if you hold this identity or this race or this whatever, or this origin or this belief, you should never talk to a person with that belief or that origin mm-hmm. or that race. I don't believe that. I think I think people are a lot more complicated than that. And I think we we close ourselves off too much. It's It's a safety mechanism. It's a coping strategy. You know, I just don't want to think about it in these ways. And look, if that, wor- if that works for you now, that's great. Because all... The the only ask here is to get one step more curious. Mm -hmm. So it does not mean, and like, you know, triggering language coming up, but it does not mean go talk to a Nazi tomorrow. Does Mm -hmm. not mean that. Nope. Nobody wants that. (laughs) It means build the short bridges. Somebody that you agree with on a lot of things except this one thing. That's where the practice starts. Um, So everybody knows where they can and can't wade. So as we kind of wind down here, let's talk about the podcast. It's called A Braver Way. Why did you start that? Because I think the conversation about why this is important has been robust. And it's more understood that something is broken and we need to do something. I think that's clear. The word polarization is out there, right? Politicians, people in the media, we all know how divided we are. We get it. Now the big question is how? How do we do this? Okay, I get it. It's a good idea. Great. I get it. It could help us. Fine. But how? Right. Because I've got this particular situation or this particular relationship or what does it do to my rights? Or don't I betray my own views? Or am I not abdicating my values? Or this, that, and the other thing. So this is a podcast to e- equip and e- extract the tools from real stories of people who have bridged the divide across a difference. And then, and then equip our listeners with those tools. Mm. The, every episode is designed to do exactly that. Every episode tells a story. Um, I'm exceedingly proud of this podcast <laughs> as a journalist. Um, I, I even break some rules in journalism in it because I have come to learn that, that I think the best role of a journalist or anyone who is trying to help society understand itself is not just to tell and search for truth, but also to help people build trust. And sometimes those two purposes are at cross purposes. Mm -hmm. If you are working on building trust, you can't spend every breath correcting someone or telling them they're wrong. You have to listen for something underneath. They're deeper concerns. Tell me a story. You know, maybe you believe something I think is a total lie, but I want to understand what meaning you find for your life in, in that before I just dismiss you out of hand. So... We do that. We do that on this podcast. So let's, if we can, can you, can you give us a a specific example kind of in a, in a a thumbnail version of what one of your episodes looks like, who you, do you bring guests on and so forth? Oh yeah. Yeah. So yes. Episode four of our first season featured a Republican governor of Utah, Spencer Cox and the leading LGBTQ activist in Utah, Troy Williams. Definitely on opposite sides of a lot, but they agree on one thing, which is that the best way to fight for what you believe is not to dehumanize the people who disagree with you. They have done that in their own work in pretty remarkable ways, and it has actually led to some pretty extraordinary policy stories in the state of Utah, um, which I could go into, but you should just go to listen to the episode. There's a lot of them and they're really, really cool. Um, One of the things that Troy Williams does that I think is like radically awesome. uh, He once had his, his, uh, his nonprofit equality, Utah, go get a booth at the Republican convention in Utah. Okay. And big surprise there, right? And they, they arrived ready to hear people. You know, they had their materials about trans rights and gay rights, but they arrived ready to hear people. And so one of the things Troy did and still does is when he talks with someone who is just really uncomfortable with some of the things he advocates for, he listens to them and he offers his perspective and his arguments. But at the end, he always closes by saying, 
I want to give you the last word. What would you like to leave me with? So Troy does that with somebody else. That's remarkable. Hmm. So anyway, they bring, <laughs> they bring up these strategies and it's the kind of thing where you'd think no politician and no activist would ever do anything except throw grenades at the other side rhetorically. And that's simply not true. There are people doing different things. So that's one of our stories. One of the, the takeaways for me here is the power of being able to listen to each other and how that seems to just naturally diffuse the whole situation, right? Yeah. We don't become reactive. We don't become retaliatory. We're able to listen and hear and appreciate each other. Yeah, there are differences, but in a, in a human, humane way, mm -hmm. which at this time in the, in the world now, it just seems like that's not being done a lot. No. We're not listening. Everyone's got their, you know, whatever, ready, are, their handguns ready to go. And mm -hmm. I live in Bend, Oregon, oh. which is a very interesting politically, is a very interesting place because it's, it's definitely polar. I mean, you've got 50-50, it's divided. Yeah. And uh, it's it's, you feel it. You know, you feel this, this angst. You don't feel what you're talking about is this uh, willingness to listen yeah. and hear. Yep. And so, it's because people are scared, you know, it's, it's, right. and it's because they have good reason to be scared, I suppose. We just need to make sure we're not too scared. All right, Monica, um, a braver way. Uh, what's the best way for people to learn about you, to f find out about your book and your podcast? Yeah. So if you go to moniguzman.com, that's my website has everything. A Braver Way podcast, you can find anywhere podcasts are published. And then braverangels.org, um, that's the national nonprofit that's dedicated to this work uh, where I am grounded. Awesome. All right. We'll have all that linked up at the show notes page here. Monica, thank you so much. Super uh, interesting. And you're, you're on fire. I mean, you can feel it. Mm, <laughs> I guess it's that. Yeah. The fieriness comes out. There it's it is. awesome. Thank you Great. so much. All right. Bye. All right. Thanks. Bye bye.